focusing on cultivating lavender. So I think we must have a lot of people out there who are very um, enthusiasts for lavender. So we're we're looking forward to Jared's presentation tonight. The, um, this will be recorded and. Um, we will, if you've registered for the class, so everybody who's in the class tonight will receive a link to the, uh, the recording tomorrow, probably sometime tomorrow. We'll get it to you. And if not that, the day after. So with that, I will let Jared take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. And hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jared. Uh, Jared Grzbowski. I've been growing plants for uh, quite a while, and our focus has been on lavender and herbs for, you know, at least the last 10 years. Um, uh, we've been growing plants for the last six years at Goodwin Creek Gardens Nursery, which has been around since 1977. Um, and then more recently, we're excited to announce that we've uh, partnered with Charsaw Farms out in Napa, California. Um, so you'll, you know, pretty soon you'll find all our, our information on their website and all our plants are available over there. Uh, so if you see Charsaw or Goodwin Creek, uh, know that they're the, the same uh, company. So uh, we, we do specialize in lavender. We, we grow over 120 different varieties at the nursery. Um, and then aside from over 120 varieties of lavender, we grow around 400 other perennial plants including pollinator plants, plants for traditional medical use, and culinary herbs. Um, so I'm excited to talk about plants and specifically lavender. Uh, there does seem to be a, a, a growing desire to grow this plant. Um, so we're going to try to fit as much as we can in in an hour and a half, which is always tough for me. I'm always constantly shaving back these presentations. So uh, if I could talk to you for a couple of days, I would, but we'll see what we could get done in an hour and a half. Um, so I just uh, want to again thank the Land Steward Program at the Oregon State University at the Southern Oregon Research and Extension Center for having me back and to provide this platform. Um, they cover a, a wide range of topics and a lot of great videos and presentations from uh, from some really knowledgeable folks. So thank you. Um, so why don't we just dive right in and I, i'm a plant guy not not a computer guy so if i'm lagging on the the presentation screen i apologize here i'm gonna do my best to keep up there we go um so <clears throat> A brief history of lavender. You know, we're all excited about lavender, but people have been excited about lavender for, for thousands of years. Um, most lavender species that we're familiar with and that are widely grown today are native to the mountainous regions of the Mediterranean's western half, including Spain, France, and Italy, uh, with some species even have coming from the southwest Arabian Peninsula. Um, Lavender, uh, Lavandula stocas is by far the species with the widest spread, uh, covering pretty much all around the Mediterranean. Um, and then other species are kind of, uh, you know, more centralized to, to smaller areas, but definitely a Mediterranean plant. Um, so it really likes that climate. Um, you know, the, the name lavender, as we, as we get into this and talking about the history um, I, I'm big into the scientific names of plants and, you know, the Latin names of plants. I, I think it's really important. And it tells you a lot about the plant as well. Like lavender, for example, the, the root word of lavender is uh, lavar, which means to wash. And, you know, looking back at some of the, the more uh, traditional uses, uh, lavender was a favorite ingredient in uh, baths for both the Greeks and Romans. Um, oftentimes they would crush the plant up and, and throw it on the floor of their castles or their sick houses uh, to act as a disinfectant or a deodorant. Um, traditionally, going back, lavender was more used for its touted medicinal properties um, than necessarily for the bath and body, although that, that certainly played a large role. Um, you know, so they were using it for uh, trying to relieve headaches, uh, dealing with insomnia, toothaches, digestion issues, uh, along with bathing in it and using it as a deodorant and, and a lovely smelling plant. Um, 
the first documented uses of lavender go back over 2,500 years. And I wouldn't be surprised if the history is longer than that as well. Uh, but that's as far back as we have record of it being used and talked about. Um, it was also used uh, for culinary purposes, um, especially powdered lavender, which they considered a condiment, uh, was used to help uh, not only preserve, but to hide the, the icky smells of the meats they had back then. You know, there was no refrigeration, so meats were hard to store if you can store them at all. And so they would use lavender to try to cover up those, the sense of the, the rotting flesh and, and to preserve that meat. So it was heavily used that way as well. Um, lavender has was always wild harvested uh, where it grew. So, you know, the people using it were using the species that they had growing in their areas. And for the longest time, it was, it was only wild harvested. Um, later on, it did find itself into gardens um, and then eventually into cultivation. Uh, now, some of the first cultivation was in uh, the south of France, and that that didn't really happen until about the 1920s, when you know people were taking these native species and and thinking they could grow them out better in a more controlled environment. Um, and so that that kind of started in, in about the 20s and has has just taken off from there. Um, some of the first lavender cultivated large scale was uh, Lavandula cross intermedias. Um, and I think that was partially due to their their high oil content, and you know that particular species is right in that native range of of the south of France. Um, lavender seems to have made its way to uh, to North America sometimes in the in the late 1600s, um, and then into the 1700s it was pretty widely available. Uh, and people were experimenting and planting it almost anywhere they could. You know, lavender's pretty picky about its uh, environment, so it didn't thrive in a lot of areas. Uh, but they continued trying, and and by the 1700s, it was a pretty readily available plant in uh, North America. The first commercial planting came long after that. Um, was around. Um, was it 19, I think 1940 or so that L.J. Wyckoff planted the first commercial planting in North America. And that was around the Seattle area. He thought it would be a good good area to grow this plant commercially and see if they can distill some oil uh, like they were doing in France and elsewhere. So, um, you know, lavender's been around for a long time. And, and the great thing is the the uses that they found for it back then still apply today. Uh, the nice thing is now we have some research to, to back it up as well. So there are many different uses for lavender. Um, you know, for the small scale gardener, uh, lavender is a great pollinator plant. It's gonna bring the beneficial pollinators into your garden. Um, you know, you can harvest some, uh, some fragrant bouquets for your table and even dry some for teas or and your favorite recipes. Um, you know, getting into large scale, more and more people are are interested in in starting lavender farms. And for good reason. There uh, again, there's just so many uses and it, it's so beautiful. Um, so large scale growers are growing for many different reasons. Um, oil distillation is a big reason. Dry bundle production, people love their dry bundles. Um, Culinary buds, uh, lavender has always been, but is kind of regaining popularity in, on the culinary end. Um, in fact, all the local coffee shops around this area seem to be carrying some sort of lavender uh, coffee drink on their menu. Uh, of course, value-added products uh, is probably the most widely uh, used <laughs> reason these days, which you know are soaps, salves, lotions, tinctures, um, things like that. Um, and then agritourism has just really blown up. You know, people want to get out and see these these farms, whether they're small scale farms or large scale farms. Uh, we work with a lot of wholesale growers, and it's interesting that you know some of them that's their main objective is the agritourism and planting the plants and making the products is kind of just a way to get people you know to to further that um, you know event, but. Yeah, they're really into getting people out to the farm and, and showing off their, their rows of lavender. Um, 
you know, it, lavender still is a great medicinal plant as well. And again, there is a lot more research to back up some of these uh, claims that have been made against it. Uh, lavender is great if you're experiencing poor sleep. It's good for some pain, anxiety, relaxation, uh, wounds, especially burns, um, bacterial and fungal infections, headaches, bug bites, uh, many different uses for lavender. Um, we have uh, free range chickens out here and one of our chickens got this really, really horrible wound. And, you know, we weren't sure if we were actually going to be able to save this bird. Uh, but my wife, uh, Anna, who actually put the, this beautiful presentation together, um, she got out the lavender hydrosol and we cleaned that wound with the lavender hydrosol and, and kept it clean. And that chicken made an incredible recovery. Um, you know, it wasn't a scientific uh, study. We didn't do documentation and, and all that, but we have to, you know, believe that the lavender played a major part in that, that poor chicken's recovery. So really versatile, amazing plant with many uses, whether you're just trying to attract some pollinators or you want to go full scale and, and make all your lavender products. Um, so... Lavandula the genius. Um, I want to quickly talk a little bit about um, the scientific names versus common names. It gets real important if you're, um, you know, trying to decide what type of lavender you want to grow, whether it's for your garden or for large scale farming. Uh, important to get beyond the common names. And honestly, this goes for a lot of plants as well. I definitely encourage uh, folks to start taking a look at these scientific names and, and doing the best you can on them. It could be intimidating. Some of them are real long. I don't know anybody these days that's real fluent in uh, Latin or Greek. So, you know, we do the best we can, but uh, it does tell a bit of a story and it kind of takes out the gray area from all these common names. So when we talk about lavender, uh, that falls in the genius Lavandula. All lavenders are lavandulas. Um, now that's gonna include all lavenders. Now after genius, uh, you'll usually see listed the specific epithet. Most often this, you'll hear people refer to this part as a species and I'm guilty of it myself. I kind of just automatically say species, uh, but really species is a combination of the genius and the specific epithet that gets you the species type. Uh, but to simplify it, we know the genus is Lavandula, and then we'll talk about some specific species of lavender. Now, amongst these species, um, you know, some species like Lavandula angustifolia has hundreds of different varieties. Um, you know, so it can still be tough to figure out what's going to work for you and your situation. Um, but knowing the scientific names and, and the genius kind of uh, gives you a leg up. You know, if you're at the local nursery and, and you find a plant that's listed as Buena Vista, you know it's lavender, but if you don't know the genius or species, you know, Buena Vista doesn't tell you much. But if you know that it's a Lavandula angustifolia, you already know that it's gonna be, you know, a, a good culinary variety. Uh, you'll know the bloom period, you'll know the hardiness of that plant. Um, so the name says a lot, as, as opposed to just the, the common names of these. Um, so the three most common species of lavender that are grown today would be your Lavandula angustifolia. Uh, these are commonly referred to as true lavenders or English lavenders. Um, they're my favorite of all the lavenders. They're very useful. They're beautiful. Again, there's hundreds of varieties of Lavandula angustifolia. There's dwarf varieties, there's pink flowers, white flowers, and almost every shade of purple you can imagine. Um, then there's the Lavandula cross intermedias. These are interesting in that it's a, it's a naturally occurring hybrid. Uh, you'll hear these commonly referred to as lavendins or French lavender or hybrid lavender. Um, this particular species occurs naturally where its parents' plants have an overlap in their habit. Um, 
and Lavandula intermedias are the most widely cultivated lavender species out there. Um, so if you're looking, especially in the farming uh, situation where people are planting rows of lavender, um, you know, it's pretty dominantly um, the intermedias, especially in that region of southern France, uh, which is probably where it can get that common name of French lavender because it's it's very widely grown out there. Um, another pretty common species is the Lavandula stocas. Um, this one has some common names as, of Spanish lavender, French lavender, butterfly lavender, or topped lavender. And you can see the little picture down there. They're the ones that bloom early and they've got the big twirly bract on it. Really beautiful. And going back to the traditional uses, it, the Lavandula stocas were actually the most widely used species uh, for culinary, oil, baths, scents, all of that. Uh, the interesting thing is that particular species has really fallen out of use and been replaced by the angustifolias and intermedias. And the stokas are, are mainly just kind of looked at as ornamental plants these days. They're very high in camphor, so the, the flavor's not great. Um, you know, they don't produce a great oil. Um, some of them do make dry bundles, but, you know, definitely kind of mainly for the, the landscape. Um, so when when you're trying to decide what kind of lavender to get, you know, now we've slightly gone over the uh, the genius and the species. Um, but then after that, again, you've got all these varieties to choose from. Um, so when you're you're trying to make your variety selection, first, you want to look at your climate. That's going to be the most important thing. Not all lavenders are suited for every climate. Uh, so you want to make sure that the lavender you're selecting is well suited. Now, you can kind of push the limits uh, on these things, you know, with a little more care and, and preparation. You, could, you can have success growing them outside of their desired climate. But the more you can match that, the more you'll have success and uh, the more you'll, you know, have bees on your lavender. Um, so Lavandula and Gustafolias, again, they're going to be very hardy plants. Most of those are hardy down to zone five. Um, they have probably the most, most uses out of all the species. They're the preferred uh, lavender for culinary buds. They've got a really nice flavor. Um, they make a high quality essential oil with a nice true lavender sweet smell. And again, there's hundreds of varieties with a wide range of flower colors um, and sizes. Uh, for the Lavandula and Gustafolias, uh, typical bloom time is, you know, mid to late June, depending on your climate. Um, and then there are some varieties of Angustifolia that actually bloom again in fall. Um, so to, to list a few of my favorites, it's so hard to pick favorite uh, varieties of lavender with so many. They're, to me, they're almost like kids. You, you can't pick a favorite kid. They all, you know, have their own things about them. But... Some of the Angustifolias that I really like would be like Avis Hill, Buena Vista, Cynthia Johnson, Egerton Blue, Millet, Melissa Lilac, Opal Rain, Pacific Blue, Sharon Roberts, and Tucker's Early Purple. It's hard to, again, very hard to choose, but I would say those would be some of my top varieties. And those are very versatile. With, with that lineup, you can really do almost anything. There's some great culinary varieties in there, some great oil varieties. Um, you know, another quick note on the culinary, if you see that it's a Lavandula angustifolia, you know that you can eat that plant. It's safe to eat. Now, because there's so many varieties, you will find variations in the flower color and flavor. And there are some varieties that tend to have a little bit better flavors than others. Um, you know, like Melissa, uh, for example, Lavandula angustifolia Melissa is probably the most popular um, culinary variety out there. Um, and it's got a really nice flavor. It's kind of a white flower with a little bit of pink on there, a uh, nice structure, just a great plant and a really good culinary variety, as opposed to like Royal Purple, another Lavandula angustifolia Royal Purple. Although you can eat those buds, they, they're they not as, uh, you know, 
accommodating to the palate as as the Melissa. And a lot of that has to do with the individual and their palate. Uh, we really enjoy setting up samples so people can smell the essential oil and taste the buds. And what one person says is their favorite smell or their favorite favorite flavor, the next person doesn't really like that. So, you know, if you're looking to start a farm and you're not sure which uh, varieties are going to be well suited for you, you definitely want to go with climate and then pick things that you like. You know, you want to be excited about what you're growing. So I encourage you to sample the flavors, smell the oils and, and grow the ones that excite you. Um, so the next species I want to talk about would be the Lavandula cross intermedias, often referred to as lavendins, and more and more uh, referred to as French lavender. Now you may notice throughout the presentation that there is a lot of lavenders that are commonly referred to as French lavender. So it can be tricky. We grow three different species and many different varieties that a lot of people commonly refer to as French lavender. And so, you know, if I get a call and somebody says, oh, do you grow French lavender? It's like, well, short answer, yes. <laughs> but a longer answer would be, you know, are you looking for a Lavandula intermedia? If so, what variety? Are you looking for a Lavandula stoca or are you looking for a dentata? Um, so, you know, again, back to those common names, it, it can be challenging uh, to, to really know what you're looking at and what you're looking for with those common names. Um, so Lavandula cross intermedia, again, it's a naturally occurring hybrid. Um, they're very large plants. They're, they're larger than the angustifolias, uh, close to the same hardiness as the angustifolias with many being hardy down to zone five. Um, on average, a Lavandula intermedia produces about 10 times the amount of essential oil that a Lavandula angustifolia produces. Uh, the oil is of lesser quality. There's some camphor in there, uh, which kind of changes the, you know, the smell a little bit. Um, and they're also not well suited for culinary purposes for those same reasons. It's kind of a harsh flavor. There are a couple of varieties that make it into some recipes for more um, savory dishes, but the sweet dishes and, and most of the cooking should be left to the angustifolias. Um, the Lavandula intermedias also will bloom a few weeks later than the angustifolias, which is, is really nice whether you're a small scale grower just looking for a pollinator garden or if you're harvesting rows of lavender. It extends that, that bloom period. So we've got purple longer, we're happier, the bees are happier. Um, it kind of staggers the workload if you're out there harvesting a big field. Uh, it's nice to know that half your field isn't going to be ready for a few more weeks as you try to take down those angustifolias. Um, another interesting thing about the Lavandula intermedias is they are sterile. So the, if they do produce seed, it will not germinate. So all of these are propagated from cutting. Um, and then new varieties are introduced by crossing the parent plants. Um, again, they get very large, bloom a little bit later very neat, upright plants, very long stemmed. And again, one of the most widely grown in cultivation specifically for oil distillation. Uh, the essential oil I talk about it being of, of lesser quality, it's still a really nice oil. Uh, we tend to use the intermedias if uh, what we're using it for is going through more processing such as like making soaps, um, you know, or, or some sort of detergent. And if it's a direct application, like a, a pillow spray or a salve, we tend to prefer the, the scent of the angustifolia. Um, so another species I, I wanna quickly talk about would be Lavandula stokas. Um, now this one around here is most commonly referred to as Spanish lavender, but if you hail from uh, some parts of Europe, it's heavily called French lavender. So you'll probably start to notice a trend of all these French lavenders. Um, again, stokas these days is mainly grown as an ornamental. Uh, it blooms much earlier than, than the angustifolias and intermedias. Uh, it's a lower grower. They are a bit more tender. So these you wanna keep in zone seven or eight and above. Um, but if you're in one of those warmer zones, it's gonna perform really well and be full of beautiful blooms and great for the pollinators. Um, and again, this was this 
specifically was the species that was most commonly used um, in ancient times because it's what it's what they had available. Uh, so although we don't use it for much these days, it was very heavily used, um, you know, 2,500 years ago. Uh, so again, just looking at these three particular species, the Lavandula angustifolia, your Lavandula intermedia, and your Lavandula stocas, um, you can really have blooms in your garden almost all summer from, from May to first frost with just a few plants. Um, so another reason it's important to kind of uh, learn those species and, you know, it'll kind of tell you the a snapshot of the bloom period and you can pick out a few plants that will really provide you with color for a really a prolonged uh, period. Um, so, you know, again, quickly to go back to like the angustifolias, you know, we we talked about some of their preferred uses, but again, there's there's really hundreds of varieties. And it could be really challenging to decide which ones. If you're only looking for a plant to bring in the pollinators or to add some purple or white to your garden, you almost really can't go wrong with lavender. You know, pick one that's suited for your climate and, and plant it and enjoy it. It's more if you're getting into wanting to harvest and process and you've got a product line in mind that you'll really want to focus on varietal selection within those species. Uh, for that, you know, again, just kind of sampling and, and getting out there and looking at these is the best way. That can be hard in some areas. You know, you may not have access to a place that has these samples for you. Um, so reading and research, um, you know, or find a trusted grower that could kind of walk you through the process in deciding how to choose these uh, varieties. So once you've kind of figured out, you know, the varieties and or the species and the varieties that you want to plant, then you got to look at how to actually plant these things. Um, what does lavender like? You know, what's required? Uh, how are you going to find success with this plant? Um, so, you know, most lavenders are going to require uh, three things, full sun, well draining soil and regular pruning. If you could provide those, uh, then, then you're off to a great start. Um, you know, aside from species selection, the next most critical thing in successful lavender is going to be your soil. Um, I've become a, a huge soil nerd. You know, again, we've been into growing plants for, for such a long time and my interests have, have evolved, I should say, because I haven't lost any interest in plants, but I've gained interest in more plants and, and more species and varieties. And so, you know, it's tough if you only, if you only focus on one particular plant, uh, you know, and find out what it likes for soil. Then you start diving into other plants and realize that they like something completely different. So I went on this mission to study soil and figure out, you know, what makes it what it is and the differences between it and I'm glad I did because uh, soil, again, is by far uh, one of the most critical things. It's it's really what's growing your plant. Uh, you know, a lot of us kind of just want to dig a hole and put it in there and hope everything goes well. But it's uh, there's a lot going on in there. Um, you know, soil should be living. We should all be growing organically, uh, especially with lavender. There's really no reason to not grow organically with lavender. And so your soil should be teeming with life. Um, and because there's all that life in it, I say, go meet it, go introduce yourself to your soil and get to know it um, and, and learn about it a little bit. Um, you know, lavender, well-drained soil is, is a absolute requirement. Uh, lavender will quickly die if you have waterlogged soil or if there's standing water. Um, so absolutely, you need to focus on the drainage. Now, if you have poor draining soil, there are ways to improve your drainage. So, you know, if you have poor draining soil, it doesn't count you out from growing lavender. It's just going to take a little more work to get those plants happy. Um, aside from uh, well-drained, lavender loves soil structure. Um, and structure differs than texture. A and again, I... I could probably talk for an hour and a half just the, about the differences between soil texture and soil structure. But to quickly summarize it, your soil texture is going to be kind of your main composition. Is it mostly sand? Is it mostly clay? 
or silt, or is it a combination of those things? Uh, you might assume that lavender loving well-drained soil would prefer sandy soil. And although that, you know, a lot of times is the case, again, um, we've got pretty heavy clay out here and we find great success. I really like working with clay soil. Um, you know, you just got to work it a little bit differently and, and know what you're looking for. Um, so well-drained, well-structured, and then also lavender does not like a lot of nutrients or organic matter. So, you know, actually poor, poor soils will help lavender thrive. If your soil is too organic or, you know, has too many nutrients, you could run into a lot of issues. Um, so to quickly focus on that, that structure again, you know, um, again, texture is the actual makeup of your soil and structure is how those particles are held together. Uh, again, take clay, for example. A lot of times clay soil is very compacted. There's no airspace. It's very hard and tough to dig in. Um, you know, there's not much structure there. It, all the structure has been pushed out and it's just a solid block of clay. Um, lavender's not going to like that. M not many plants are going to like that. Plants need oxygen at their roots. They need water uh, red readily available. And so adding structure is adding interest uh, to your soil. So if you, if you have clay and it's one homogenous block of, of hard clay, you can add structure in by breaking that up and adding compost or pumice or some other amendment. And you add that interest uh, and that structure to it. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more detail that of that here in a minute. Um, you know, one another thing to focus on is not to overwork your soil. And again, this this is whether you're planting one plant or if you're planting ten acres of lavender. Um, you know, structure should be at the top of your list, drainage and structure. And if you overwork your soil, you lose a lot of that structure. Um, again, going back to clay, just because we're we're real familiar with working with it, and a lot of people have to deal with it. You know, say you're tilling your clay it breaks apart really quickly into fine little clay particles. And if you overwork it and you, you just break it into a dust, you know, as soon as moisture hits that, all those aggregates are going to separate. And then when it dries out, it's going to form together into another block. Um, so when you're working your soil, whether it's clay or silt or sand, you want to leave it chunky. Again, the chunks are your structure. They're your interest. Um, I'm a huge fan of compost, so I add compost to almost anything we plant. Uh, again, lavender doesn't like a whole lot of compost, but adding some in to gain that structure uh, can go a long way. Um, so focus on the chunky structure. Uh, beyond that, also, lavender does like neutral to alkaline soil. Uh, so the pH of your soil is pretty important to uh, grow lavender successfully. Um, anywhere a range of about 6.7 to 7.4, you know, you could fluctuate out of that a bit, um, but it really wants that neutral to alkaline soil. Um, the Lavandula intermedias have shown that they can tolerate a little bit more acidity than the Angustifolias. Uh, same with the Stokas, but for the most part, kind of aim for that, you know, seven range on your pH. Uh, again, if your pH is off there are ways to correct that um you know if you're too low you can add lime too high and you can add sulfur or, or other things so there's ways to correct it one thing to keep in mind is sometimes those corrections can take a while you know say your ph is is down at the high fives or low sixes you want to bring that up almost a whole point that that's going to take a while uh, i usually recommend doing that over a whole season and so if you're planning on planting a large plot, I recommend starting your planting early. And most importantly is getting a soil analysis and getting that snapshot and coming up with a plan based on that. Um, a soil analysis is extremely valuable. Um, and if you're just planting a couple plants, probably not necessary. You can get an at-home pH kit and check your pH. Uh, you could kind of do your own drainage test um, but if you're going large scale at all, you know, it's it's extremely valuable to get this soil analysis and then analyze it and decide where to go from there. 
uh, keeping in mind that some of these changes can take a while. Um, you know, so, so talking about environment and soil, um, you know, our nursery is here in Southern Oregon, and this is just an absolute ideal uh, climate for growing lavender. We're very lucky. Um, we get away with a lot. Uh, and so sometimes we take that for granted, and then you look at people growing outside of the desired range, and, and they're struggling a bit. So one thing to focus on is the more you get outside of lavender's desired range, the more you want to focus on getting these points lined up. If you're in an area that experiences a little bit too much humidity over summer, you want to make sure that your soil is dialed in and your pH is dialed in, um, you know, and that way you can pick up a little slack on, on these plants getting a little extra humidity. So, um, you know, the more your environment is well suited for lavender, the more you could kind of get away with, you know, a little bit too low of a pH or, you know, soil issues. Uh, but always keep that in mind that, you know, go for ideal uh, conditions and then you can always adjust out of that as well. Um, so, you know, now that we've got the well drained soil, uh, not much nutrients and good structure um you know another extremely important part of lavender is watering and i get more questions about watering lavender than any other questions uh when it comes to lavender um it's very critical to get this right and if you ask five different farmers um how to correctly water lavender you'll probably get five different answers does that mean that four of them are wrong or all of them are wrong or they're all right they could all be right. Uh, watering is extremely dependent on your plot, your microclimate, soil, your weather. Unfortunately, there is no one uh, exact method for how often and how much you should be watering your lavender. So since I can't give you that, I can tell you what to look for and then you can make the assessments and, and kind of dialing uh, your water uh, from there. Now, uh, again, I can't stress the importance of watering not only lavender, but any plant. Um, you know, I stand behind the statistic that almost 70% of issues in the garden or the greenhouse can be traced back to watering issues, whether it's too much water, not enough water, watering too frequently. So, you know, if, if you can become an expert at one thing in the garden, I suggest it be watering and it's enjoyable as well, you know, to water these plants, whether you're doing it by hand or setting up drip, but spend the time, learn your soil, learn the plant watering needs and requirements and match that and, and you'll be well on your way to success. Um, you know, to, to quickly explain how variable this can be, um, our garden here, in fact, I just watered my lavender for the first time this season, just today. Uh, you know, so again, we're pretty well situated where we don't have to water a lot. Um, but our plants over here take way less water than my parents' garden, which is literally across the street, literally across the street and about a thousand feet away. And our gardens require vastly different watering needs. Um, and why would that be, you know, one huge role is the soil, you know, we've been working on our soil differently. It's slightly different native to, to what they've got over there. Um, our property is just, I guess, slightly more Easternly facing and there's this nice Southern exposure. Um, our property sits a little bit lower, so it's a little bit wetter over winter and kind of holds on to that water table. Um, but you know, recommending the amount of water to put on her garden right across the street would be way different than what we're doing here. So if somebody gives you a definite answer of this is how much water, uh, most likely they're not taking these things into account. So it's really case by case basis. Um, so when it comes to determining uh, how much water you should be putting on, on your lavender, there are some standards. And the, the biggest thing to focus on is lavender thrives from deep infrequent waterings. And what that means is when you do water, you wanna put a good amount of water on that plant. 
now there is you can put too much you you don't want to see runoff you know or really wet muddy conditions but when you do water you want to water deep um you want that water to penetrate you know 12 inches down even 15 inches down uh below the surface and then with lavender after you get that good saturation then you cut it out and you you let it dry out a bit um and, you know, again, this is really going to depend on the age of the plants. Young plants with small root zones are going to be watering more frequently. Um, but the older, more mature plants, you know, you can really let them dry out quite a bit uh, between your next watering. Um, these deep, infrequent waterings will also improve the drought tolerance of these plants. You know, lavender is very drought tolerant once established and can be even more drought tolerant depending on how you've raised this plant. If you practice deep infrequent waterings, you're gonna have a deep root system. You know, as, the, as your soil surface dries out, those roots are gonna chase that moisture down deep and you'll have deep anchored roots uh, where it'll stand up to prolonged periods of drought. If you're doing shallow waterings, most of your root mass is gonna be right up at the top. Uh, your plant's going to be more susceptible to issues, and it'll definitely require water more frequently. So get those deep roots, water deep, then let it dry out. Now, when I say dry out, again, it's going to depend on the age of the plant. So, you know, young plants in their first year, um, you want to be physically checking this. So after you water, you want to dig down and actually check your soil. And if you find moisture, you know, a half inch under the surface, I would hold off on watering. Now on a young plant, if you dig down and your soil is dry an inch below the surface or two inches below the surface, that's when you wanna uh, give it its next watering. The mature plants, um, you, could, you could almost dig down an inch and a half or two inches looking for moisture. Um, in fact, yesterday when I was determining whether or not our field needed water, um, I was digging down and it was dry three inches below the surface and I didn't even go any deeper than that, you know, but I got down three inches and it was totally dry and I thought tomorrow's a day. And so I, I gave them a really good soak. These are more mature plants. I probably put about a, a little over a gallon of water per plant. Again, we have clay soil, so that water is going to spread out a bit more. If you have mature plants with sandy soil, you may be putting a little bit more than a gallon per plant every time you water. Um, so again, when you are watering, water deep, then let it dry out, then water again. Now again, the, the more ideal of a climate you, you live in for growing lavender, the more you're going to get away with um, you know, pushing those boundaries. So for those folks that might be trying to grow lavender uh, where it's you know, slightly out of their recommended range, dialing in the water is going to be even more important um, so really focus on that uh, get to know your soil learn how quickly it dries out um, you can use moisture meters i'm not a huge fan of them i'm, I'm more of a fan of, of getting down there and physically checking um, but you really want to get that dialed in now the plants will show you signs of, of whether they're overwatered or underwatered you know overwatered plants can start taking on some yellow coloring, um, underwatered plants. If they're flowering, the stems will start to droop. If they're not in flower, you know, they almost take on a little bit more of a dried look when they're really thirsty. But lavender can get very, very, very thirsty before it's going to die from not being watered. So err on the side of less water and let them get thirsty and then give them a really good drink and kind of repeat that process. Um, uh, again, you know, overwatering can cause a lot of issues. Most of the time when people talk about overwatering, it means watering too frequently and not too much at one time. Again, there is too much. So uh, you really don't want to flood these with like, you know, three, four gallons per plant. Um, but overwatering is more commonly referred to as watering before it needs it. So if your soil is moist, and you decide to put more water on, even if it's just a little bit, that is overwatering. Uh, so avoid overwatering, especially in these outlying areas that are dealing with any sort of uh, humidity, especially humidity combined with heat. 
Uh, that's a, a real bad combo for lavender. So you really want to get your watering dialed in uh, for that. You know, overwatering can definitely lead to issues, inc including rot and wilt. Um, so I can't stress enough that, you know, dialing in the watering, again, across all plants is, is really uh, time well spent. Um, so I, I want to talk about pruning a little bit because pruning is also very critical for healthy, long-lived plants. And <clears throat> there, there's a few reasons for that. You know, if you've ever seen lavender that's sprawling or really woody and, and floppy, most likely it's missed a pruning or two or, or more. Um, and so pruning, uh, it en encourages new growth, but mostly it encourages that nice structure, those nice round plants. When you see a beautiful field of lavender and they're perfectly round with their straight stems, pruning is absolutely critical for that. Um, and it, it starts young. We start pruning these plants, you know, as soon as they break dormancy in the greenhouse. Um, and we typically don't like to release plants to customers until we've pruned them two or three times. Um, you know, the plant is young. It takes a lot of energy to produce those flowers. And so a lot of the plant's energy is focused on that. When you cut those flowers off, it allows some of that energy to be used on rooting. And then also, wherever you cut it, you'll get it to flush out and grow bushier and rounder, which is what we want. Uh, a more bushy round plant equals more flowers. So as hard as it can be, especially, you know, you, you go to the store and you get your new lavender plant and you plant it in your garden. For the whole first season, I recommend pruning all the flowers off. And you'll be rewarded. The first year will be tough, but it'll be well worth it. Um, you know, the one time to hit for sure on the pruning would be fall. That's the most important time. Uh, if you're getting into fall and you've still got spent stems on your plants, you really want to get those off. Um, and so fall is a great time. As far as timing, I usually recommend going back at least 30 days before your first average frost and pruning around that time. Uh, that way the plant has a little bit of recovery time before it has to deal with those extremes, uh, including frost. So lavender is tough and will stand up to the frost, but if you if you prune it and it gets shocked with that, you, you can experience some issues. So, you know, at, at least a month before your last uh, first frost, you should be out there pruning and shaping, cutting off any loose stems on the bottom, getting all those flowers off, um, and getting it set up for winter. Um, you want to prune pretty hard, but you want to avoid the woody stems. And so when you look at a lavender plant, a mature lavender plant that may be, you know, three feet around, and it looks all green and lush, usually there's only a, a couple to a few inches of lush green growth. And then if you pry your way in there, it's a big mess of woody stems. So when you're pruning, you really want to get into that green growth, but you don't want to get down into those woody stems. The older the plant is, the less likely it is to recover from a heavy pruning. Uh, that's why, again, starting young is critical. You know, these young plants, prune them hard, get that shape, get that structure, and, you know, they'll be much longer lived and better shaped. Um, trying to stay on time here too. I'm, I'm already trying to shave off a little bit of things. So if there's, you know, we're going to save some time for questions at the end, but if you have questions beyond that, you know, I'll give you my email at the end and feel free to email or call and be happy to answer any more questions about any of this. Um, so now that we've got our lavender in, it's growing successfully. We've spent all the time making our, our selections of varieties. We've got our soil correct. We've got good drainage. We've got good structure. Um, you know, we've planted our plants, we've pruned them for the whole first year, as hard as that was. The exciting part is eventually it's going to lead to harvest. And harvest is amazing. Uh, again, whether you're only harvesting one plant in your garden or if you're harvesting 10 acres, um, there's nothing, nothing like a lavender harvest. Um, you know, looking at that, again, you've spent so much time on this that went on this plant that when it comes to harvesting, you, you don't want to skimp out at this part. 
really focus on quality, um, especially for these farms. You know, we talk about there's a lot of new farms coming on and they're trying to figure out a way to distinguish themselves from the farm that might be down the road growing the same plants, making the same products. And one way is to definitely focus on quality. Um, it's really apparent um, when you are using good quality herbs to when you're using poor quality herbs. Um, we're sticklers for quality when it comes to herbs, not only lavender, but all the other herbs we harvest and use. Um, I've seen some of these herbs ordered online and have just been shocked at what people are getting. Um, so quality is very important. So when you're looking at harvesting quality lavender, you know, you really want to look at timing. Um, and this is another one of those things where if, if you ask five different farmers, you'll probably get five different answers on when they're harvesting their lavender. So I'll give you a quick snapshot of what we do here on this farm. Um, and then you're welcome to, you know, experiment off of there or, or research further and see what other people are saying about it. Um, so for us, you know, our first harvest would be for our culinary buds. Um, now, when you look at a lavender flower, if you look at the ones on the display there, you'll notice that it's it's made up of mainly two parts. You have the calyx or the calyx, which is the bud, and then you have the corolla or the blossom that flowers out of that bud. So when you're trying to time harvest, we rely on those corollas or those blossoms. So for your culinary buds, we're trying to harvest uh, our culinary buds right as the first blossoms are opening, um, even sometimes, you know, right before they're opening. Uh, but you want to get them early for those uh, those quality culinary buds. Um, you know, when when you harvest these and debud them and you've got all these blossoms in there, not only does you, do you start to lose some of that flavor profile, but it's a lot more work to clean these buds to get them ready for use. So that's a great time. That's kind of what we go by. It's right as those first blossoms are opening, you're doing your first harvest for culinary. Now, if you're just looking for vivid dried bundles, vibrant that stay purple for years and smell great for years uh, we typically wait until about 30 to 50 percent of the blossoms or corollas have opened on that plant um, at that timing you know the plants are are considered in full flower they're very vibrant and that's a great time to harvest for dried bundles um, now, when, if we're harvesting for oil distillation, that's the last of our harvest. Uh, we typically wait until all of the corollas or blossoms have opened, um, and and maybe even once a few have start started to fade on the plant. So, again, that's kind of just a real general guideline, a good place to start if you're not sure at all when you should be harvesting this. Uh, but that's going to get you really good quality uh, buds or oil. Um, you know, if you kind of uh, use those those generalizations um, and and again going back to if you if you're involved in this just to grow a plant for the pollinators uh, the best time to harvest for that is once the pollinators move away you know as the plant flowers and those blossoms open it's going to be full of life and it'll be buzzing with bees and pollinators um, and then as that plant fades you, you'll notice a uh, little less action on there. And so, you know, we typically wait till we don't see any more action on the plant. The flowers have clearly faded and that's when we'll come in and we'll do our, our summer pruning and get those flowers off and start to work on getting that plant ready for winter. Um, but again, if you're growing for pollinators in the pollinator garden, let them go uh, until they stop using it. And we always encourage leaving some for the pollinators. We do not harvest all of our lavender. We uh, specifically save some for the pollinators. Uh, and we encourage farms to do that as well. You know, there's, uh, I love going out to a big 10 acre plot and seeing, you know, 20,000 flowering lavender plants, but then it kills me when right at peak pollination, they're taking all the flowers away and leaving nothing for the bees. So. Leave a row for the pollinators. Uh, they'll be happy, we'll be happy. Um, so I definitely encourage that. Um, so another thing to, to focus on when you're harvesting is the drying process. Um, you know, not only do you wanna harvest at, at peak time, but then you wanna dry it properly. 
Uh, I recommend drying um, these lavenders in a cool, dark room. I think I got ahead of myself there. Um, you know, we have a very dark, dry space. There's no light in there. We built it specifically for drying herbs. Um, if you don't have anything like that, you can use a closet. Um, but you want to bundle the lavender up and hang it upside down and dry it fairly slowly, you know, over the course of about six days or so. Uh, you don't want to dry it too fast. And then if you're drying it too slowly, uh, then you can start running into issues with mold on your lavender. So that, you know, six days and to achieve that, a, a dark, cool space, about 65 degrees Fahrenheit and about 55 percent humidity, it's absolutely ideal. Um, you know, lavender harvest typically falls in summertime when it's really hot. A lot of these farmers just hang them in the hot barns and still find really good success with that. So, again, always strive for the best uh, quality, but realize that you can do a lot even if, if you can't, you know, get those perfect conditions. Um, and once the lavender is dried, you know, you'll want to take it down and store it properly, which you can store it in similar conditions, a nice, dark, uh, dry space. You can use a cardboard box or plastic bins uh, to store them. Um, and then a proper dry is pretty critical in debudding. Excuse me. So if you're looking at doing culinary buds or you want to make sachet bags, so you need to get those buds off. It's a nightmare if that plant wasn't dried properly. Those buds do not want to come off. Uh, so there is more to it, you know, than just quality. It's it's ease of debudding as well. You know, you want them really nice and dry and to be dried correctly, and it'll be much easier to process them after that. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about propagation. Now, I will say that, uh, you know, we did a propagation class in fall and that video is available on YouTube. So if you have a lot of specific questions about propagation, I would encourage you to watch that video. The video is about propagation in general. So we cover seeds, cuttings, division, but we do focus heavily on lavender as well. So we go over a lot from the conditions, how to take the cutting. And so if you're here for propagation, I would uh, I would refer you to that video also through the OSU Land Stewards Program. You'll be able to find it on their uh, page there. I do want to talk briefly about it because again, this is a lavender class, and lavender propagation is what we do. And I know a lot of people are interested in it. Uh, we propagate all lavender from cutting. Um, there are a few species that you can start from seed. Um, but a lot of those won't come true to type. So going back again to the Lavandula and Gustafolias, uh, they produce a lot of seed and they start fairly easily. Um, you know, they can be a bit challenging to start. Um, if you are starting seed, I recommend uh, stratifying them, putting them through the cold process. Uh, but the problem with starting Lavandula and Gustafolia seed is it's not going to be an exact uh, representation of, of the parent. There's going to be some variation. Sometimes it might be minor variation. You may not even be able to tell the difference, but there may be a difference in the, the composition of the oil or the flavor. Um, so if you're looking for specific varieties to accomplish a specific task, you'll wanna look for plants that were propagated by cutting. Now, the cool thing about starting seed is if you start a bunch of seed, you may discover that next uh, popular lavender variety. Um, a lot of these new varieties are just chance seedlings, you know, that somebody didn't intend to find a new variety, but they were observant and they saw it pop up and they watched it and realized that it was, you know, different from the parent. Uh, and, and you're able to name that as a new variety. Here at Goodwin Creek Gardens, we're fortunate that we have the famous Goodwin Creek Gray Lavender. Uh, going back again to the whole genius and species, um, a lot of species have many different varieties. Goodwin Creek Gray is Lavandula gingensii, and it is the only variety in that gingensii species. So it's very unique. Um, it was a chance seedling that popped up in our greenhouse, and the previous propagators recognized it as something unique and they saved it and it's become one of the most popular planted varieties out there. 
Uh, it's mainly an ornamental and it is frost uh, sensitive. So it's more suited for warm climates. But in those warm climates, uh, Goodwin Creek Gray will bloom almost all year round. It's got incredibly uh, silvery gray foliage. And it was an accident that somebody just noticed and, and saved it. So, you know, it's fun to start seeds. But again, if you're looking for, for specific varieties, uh, fine cutting propagated plants. The same would go for the uh, Lavandula intermedias. Again, most of those are sterile. So the seeds aren't going to start anyways, if, even if they produce them. Uh, but those are all propagated by cutting. Um, Lavandula stocas, uh, those are probably the most easily reseeded. In fact, a lot of times you'll find volunteers popping up in your yard of those. Uh, now those come pretty true to type, but there are some variations. So again, if you're if you're looking for specific varieties, go with cutting. Um, we take all of our cuttings in fall here. You know, I, I believe in growing strong plants. We grow naturally and organically, um, and, and we try to match the natural rhythm. So we are taking semi-right to hardwood cuttings in fall, and we root them and overwinter them in a cold greenhouse. They do get protection uh, from, a, you know, taking the edge off of the cold and, and the wind and the rain. But we do not heat our greenhouses. We want those cuttings to go dormant and stay dormant for as long as possible. Um, you know, to, to quickly re-mention something about these Lavandula and Gustafolias and Intermedias, they require that, that cold period, similar to fruit trees. If you're ever shopping for fruit trees, you may notice that they have a required chill time. And if you're in too warm of a climate and that fruit tree does not get its required amount of chill time, it's not going to produce uh, as well. And these lavenders are similar. And so if you're in a very warm climate that does not allow these plants to go dormant over winter, you may not be as successful with these particular species. Uh, so you'd have to look for a species that will tolerate that. Um, so uh, again, you know, if you have any more specific questions about propagation, feel free to ask them at the end of the video or I mean, the end of the presentation or watch that video on the OSU Land Stewards uh, YouTube channel. And we cover a lot about uh, propagating. Um, oh, one other quick thing to watch when it comes to propagation and new varieties is sports. And this is a very interesting natural occurrence um, where, you know, you, you have a plant that's uh, all purple lavender, say sachet, for example, and you happen to notice, you know, one or two white flowers. Uh, and it's still part of the same plant, is somehow that plant just sent up this, this morphed part of it, and that's called a sport. And a lot of lavender varieties were also discovered by sports. And it, again, it's just being observant, walking the fields and watching your plants and noticing something like that. Uh, and you could be on to the next new major variety. Most lavender varieties are discovered by chance there are some that were intentionally cross-pollinated and bred, um, but most of it is just by, by chance. So be observant and, and you could be well on your way to naming uh, the next new big variety. Um, so I want to also talk about some possible problems with your lavender. Now, lavender is a very tough plant. It's very forgiving, and there are not really a whole lot of issues with it. But there are some, and uh, some of them can be pretty bad. So, um, you know, one, one of the most common problems I see with lavender, honestly, again, is incorrect watering. Um, I'll get pictures or we'll, we'll do a consulting gig on a farm and, and look at their plants and we can immediately trace it back to either underwatering or overwatering. We spend a lot of time dialing in uh, watering regimens at these farms and gardens, and you, you get massive improvements. Again, it's going to vary greatly by location, climate, all of that. So you really kind of got to know what you're looking for, that deep and frequent, letting it dry out sufficiently. Um, you know, again, a couple other things you can do um, is you can raise your rows up to provide better drainage. Um, and then also, if you're in an area that experiences uh, high summer humidity, 
and lavender does not really like that. And I say lavender, I, I'm mainly referring to the angustifolias and intermedias. There are a few species of lavender that will tolerate the humidity, but they're not great, you know, varieties to grow for in a farm setting. They're not super useful. So if you are in an area where, where you have high summer humidity, raising your plants up in rows and increasing the spacing in between the plants to encourage more airflow uh, can really help. And then again, just really dialing in the water, um, you know, would be the, if, if there's any issues with lavender, start there and, and see if it corrects it. Um, there are a few pests that will go after lavender, but really not many, especially outdoors. You know, we do a lot of greenhouse growing for our starts. So that's a whole different world in the greenhouse. The soil we use, uh, we make our own custom potting blend for the lavender. And I would never put that out in, in the garden, or I mean, in the lavender garden. Um, same with watering and pest management. It, it's totally different in the greenhouse with young plants, but outdoors, there's really not a lot of pests. Um, you know, you'll get aphids on occasion. Usually we see aphids on lavender in early spring. Um, but they usually kind of find themselves uh, off on their own. You know, we we don't ever treat. Uh, if we do have some plants that have aphids on them, I just wash them off with plain water and, and rub them with my fingers. Um, I don't use any soaps or oils or sprays, just a little bit of water. Um, but usually the plants will outpace the aphids and it, it's not usually an ongoing issue. Um, spittle bugs, you know, they'll get on there and, and they could be unattractive. And if you happen to get some of their goopy spittle on you, it, it's nice and slimy, but they're, they're not going to, you know, uh, cause any major issues with that plant. So not a lot of pests. Um, now there are some diseases that we have to worry about with lavender and there's a handful that affect them at different stages of their life. Uh, some that can be overcome and some that are, are very, very bad. Um, you know, a couple of the issues that you see with lavenders would be wilts like Fusarium wilt or Phytophthora. Um, rots, especially root rot, crown rot. That's again going to be a different species of Fusarium, pith Pythium or Phytophthora. And occasionally you'll also see like yellowing and, and brown spots, which is caused by septoria leaf spot. Um, now, some of these, you know, like septoria leaf spot, for example, you may see that pop up in uh, more humid areas. Uh, if you're in a real dry summer area, you usually don't see it too much. And if you are seeing it, it could be that you're overwatering or maybe the plants are too crowded, uh, but easily addressable. Um, wilts are most likely going to, you know, start at the nursery with the plants. Now, again, you will see some wilts out in the field if you have waterlogged soil or if you're in a high summer hum uh, humidity area, uh, those become a little bit more common. And then rots. Again, it does not take long for a lavender to rot out if it's in standing water. Uh, it happens way too quick. And when that does happen, if, if your plants are, are, are exposed to standing water, or even if your field has reached field capacity with its water, meaning it's absorbed all the water it can, and if any more water is put on that field, it's just going to run off, that, that's dangerous for lavender. You can lose them very fast. And so if you're dealing with those kind of conditions, again, you can do really uh, big raised rows. We had to do that out here at our plot. Not only are we working with clay, but we have a very wet property. And so we knew right, right away that we would be raising our rows up really high, uh, providing that drainage, focusing on structure uh, to be able to grow lavender here. And even with those big raised rows, uh, occasionally we'll, we'll lose a plant to excess moisture over winter. Um, it, you can lose a plant altogether or just part of it. So if, if you have standing water and then it dries out and you notice that your lavender, you know, looks like it has a dead spot in it, uh, that's most likely rot or water damage. 
Um, so you want to be looking for those signs. Uh, you'll you'll see them. You'll start to see them come on in late winter. But again, the plant's usually dormant and not showing too many signs of stress. But once it breaks dormancy, that's when you, all those signs start to appear and, and they're not growing as vigorously or they've got these dead spots. Um, you know, that's some sort of rot, um, most likely from excess moisture. Um, one particular type of rot I want to talk about uh, specifically for lavender would be Phytophthora. Phytophthora has become a major issue for lavender. And uh, this is another thing that we can easily do an hour and a half class on, on its own. Phytophthora literally translate to the plant destroyer. Uh, just like there are many different species of lavender, there are also many different species of Phytophthora. Not all of the species will affect lavender, but many of them do. Uh, Phytophthora is native to a lot of areas of North America, uh, depending on the region. Uh, here on the West Coast, um, Phytophthora is responsible for sudden oak death. Um, it's also wiping out the um, the Port Orford Cedar up here near Port Orford, Oregon. Um, and it, it's a, a major issue. Uh, some Phytophthora species affect citrus. And so people are seeing it uh, run through their, their citrus orchards. Um, but it, it's on lavender and we've definitely got to be aware of it. Uh, most of the la uh, Phytophthora that we're seeing on lavender is not native species. It's been introduced and it's, it's real easy to, to do a test, to send it off and determine the Phytophthora species and realize that this was brought in most likely on the plants. Now, other plants can carry this pathogen. Any plant you bring home from a nursery or any soil that you bring onto the farm, can potentially host this pathogen. Um, and so, you know, if, if you discover it on your lavender, you, you have to start asking, did it get brought in on this lavender or was it already here from something that was planted before? But you can easily determine whether it's a, a native species or if it was introduced. Mostly what we're seeing is that this pathogen is brought in on dirty plants from nurseries. Uh, and again, it's a, it's a major, major problem. This is not something that's easy to deal with. Once you once you plant it in your field, it's there and it's almost impossible to eradicate. It's very long lived. It's extremely tough and extremely aggressive. Uh, it can travel from plant to plant. Um, it loves water. Um, you know, Phytophthora itself is not a fungus, but it's it's very closely related. It's a oomycetes. And uh, the, the particular ones that attack lavender, it, it's scary if you get down into that microscopic level because they are just shooting out these spores into your soil anytime there's free water. Um, and if those spores, uh, you know, find a host, they'll attach and, and they're going to kill that plant. Once a plant is infected, there is no saving it. So you want to be really cautious uh, sourcing your lavender, uh, buy from organic nurseries. There's really no reason to be using fungicides on lavender. Um, and so if, if you're talking with your supplier, you know, ask them if they're using fungicides, ask them if they've ever dealt with Phytophthora. You know, don't be afraid to question them. As, uh, again, especially if you're planting a big plot, this is a big time and money investment. And uh, unfortunately, we've seen some of these investments just get wiped out. Uh, these people receiving and planting Phytophthora infested plants, and there's really nothing you could do about it, but try to manage it to the best of your ability. Uh, but eradication, again, is is uh, almost impossible. So something to be aware of. It's scary. We don't like it. Our nursery is is currently on lockdown. I don't bring any new plants in here. Uh, again, we make our own, all our own soil. If I am sourcing new plants, um, you know, I try to grow it from seed. If it's a new lavender variety, we have a quarantine area that we set up and we'll bring these plants in and we quarantine them for a year before we even touch them. And then we'll start to work on them. But it's, it's quite the process to get a new plant into our lineup because we are trying to keep these kind of things out. So, 
Um, you know, it's out there. You want to be aware of it. Uh, some signs in your field, again, um, you know, if, if you plant your lavender and you start to notice uh, just random dead spots, uh, that could be Phytophthora. Entire dead plants can also be Phytophthora. Um, I do recommend getting it tested uh, before you just start ripping plants out and, and replanting. Have it tested, have it analyzed, and come up with a plan uh, because it's easy to spread it around even further if you're, you know, just ripping out plants and, and moving things. So kind of unfortunate that we're up against that in the industry. Um, but, you know, it's plants and, and that's the kind of things we got to deal with. Um, so that's about it. And I actually came in a little under uh, time. Again, I tried to cut a few things out. So we've left plenty of time for questions. I've got, you know, I've got time. So if you've got questions, we could go for those. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you for hearing me out on this uh, lavender chat. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. That was just so inspirational, really wonderful, beautiful presentation put together by Anne. Is that who you said? Anna, <laughs> by your wife. <yeah. laughs> and then just your encyclopedic knowledge, just the prompts from it. It's it's great to see your passion for it and how kind of intimately you are engaged in this profession. So, so much to offer for folks. Oh, um, we had just a couple of questions here. Um, let's see so what is the plant spacing for angust angustifolias good question uh we standardize spacing at three feet for angustifolias again that's that particular species has so many different varieties um that you you know you can fit them in a little bit closer uh depending on the particular variety uh, there's some very dwarf varieties of angustifolia. We we have one Nana Alba that doesn't get more than 12 inches. So if you're looking to put lavender just in your pollinator garden, um, most of the time they should have a recommended spacing next to the variety. Uh, kind of a, a standard fallback would be that three foot spacing for angustifolias. Okay, great. I know I I am. I, I, I'm not sure if it's an optimist or what it is exactly. I always put things too close together when they're little. I think, you know, I'm going to have lots of room for all these things. And then, or I can weed yeah. things out when they get to be too cramped, but then they're there and I don't want to take them out. So I definitely put my lavender yep. too close to my, <laughs> too close to my rosemary. Um, all right. Um, how do you know, <laughs> how do you know if your soil is well draining? So one way is to just dig a hole, you know, so you go out to where you want to plant your lavender and dig a hole about a foot deep and turn the hose on and, and fill it up with water. It should drain relatively quickly. You know, if it's holding water for 20, 30 minutes or longer, I, I wouldn't consider that well drained. You want to see that running out. And, you know, so again, quickly, if you have that clay, most of the time clay is going to be overly compacted um, so you want to break that up add something uh, like compost for structure and drainage and then you could always mound up your planting hole or your rows as well okay that's good advice um somebody asked is lavender great for tick repellent I would say it's decent for tick repellent I mean we use it for that purpose uh, but we also use a mix of a couple other plants, uh, including rose scented geranium oil. So absolutely, we have we have a bottle of it right by our door and our, our girls are spraying it on their legs um, every time we go outside. Now we also have free range chickens, which is the best tick control that we've found. Um, so if you have a tick problem, chickens are awesome. But yeah, absolutely. Spray it on your legs, add that that uh, rose geranium oil and, and that can help. Nice. Good. Good advice. Well, I I just loved hearing how long lavender has been in cultivation with people. That was really great information. And um, that advice about leaving a row for pollinators, I think that that kind of goes along with, depending on what people's scale is of their involvement, just at any level, you know, leaving leaving your dead stems for bees and insects to, you know, put their things in over the fall, leaving the leaves, leaving a row for the pollinators. That was really neat. And yeah. that you have a quarantine yeah, we like a area. Tiny garden, but the pollinators. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. That's great. Okay, so uh, Janine says, awesome presentation and practices, Jared. I'll have to visit your farm sometime. Thank you. John Price said, Jared provided us with guidance uh, for what lavender to buy and plant. Oh, can you talk about this process? I think. Did, did that make for, sense? I can read it again. He says, uh, uh, so this is John Price and, and John and Aaron. Um, Jared provided us with guidance for what lavender to buy and plant. Can you talk about this process? Maybe as a surface? Yeah, so there's a few or... ways to go about it. You know, again, I guess is uh, determining what, what you want that lavender for. Are you just looking for a plant for pollinators or or do you want to use it, um, you know, for culinary buds, teas, oils? Uh, so that's going to be the first step. And that'll kind of narrow you down onto the species. Um, once you get into species, that's where it gets trickier um, because, again, there's so many varieties like Lavangula and Gustafolia, hundreds of varieties of this. So if you know that you want to grow culinary lavender and you want to produce a nice oil, you kind of narrow down that you want to grow in Gustafolias, but then variety selection could, could be tricky. And a lot of that's, again, you know, personal preference. Um, we've got I would say 30 varieties that make incredible culinary uh, varieties. We've got 30 varieties that make incredible oil varieties. So you really want to find what excites you. Um, we try to always keep samples of dried bundles and oil and buds for each plant. And that way people that come out to our farm anyways can, can really experience it and see what they like. So, um, yeah, variety selection. I mean, the, there's a reason that popular varieties become popular. So there's always the standards, you know, so if you can't find something like that in your area where you can sample it, then going with these popular varieties, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, like I said, they're popular for a reason. Um, is it, do you ever get people kind of bringing you snippets of plants and saying, can you tell what variety this is? I, it was interesting to see those kind of distinctive ones, but then the varieties, I know they can vary so subtly. Yeah, we do get that. And it's pretty challenging. Um, you know, other ones are easier than than some, like when it comes to Angustifolias, it's pretty tough. Uh, some of the other species, like if it's a Dentata, Lavangula Dentata or a Gingensii, that's an easy one. But, you know, determining the exact variety of Angustifolia can be very challenging. Uh, an, another reason for that is I mentioned that seed grown uh, Angustifolia doesn't come true to type, but it was standard practice in the industry for quite some time to grow a few varieties from seed. So if you see the, the Lavangula Angustifolia varieties of Hidco or Munstead, there's a good chance that that's not the original Hidco or Munstead, that it's some sort of variation from a seed start. So if they bring that in, you know, it's, it could be challenging, but taking pictures uh, of the blooming process is the best way, you know, taking pictures of the buds as they're forming, and then another one as they're fully formed, and then as those blossoms start to open, and email them, and, and we've got a pretty good chance of identifying it. Wow, that's great. That's great. You know, at the Extension Center, with some regularity, people will bring in, say, apples in the fall and they'll be like, can you tell what these heritage apples, you know, that are growing in my backyard, can you tell what it is? And we don't have anyone who has that level of expertise on, uh, so our, our uh, master gardeners do the best that they can, but it could be challenging when you get pieces of plants yeah. with the varieties and their agricultural, horticultural uh, varieties. All right. Yeah, oh, let's see here, one more question. What are popular varieties for farm planting? Maybe you could throw out so a few. again, mostly for farms, we're we're sticking with the angustifolias and intermedias. Uh, they're going to perform best um, for that farm setting. They they've got the most uses. So for angustifolia, some that perform really well and that are very popular that you could find good literature on would be like Betty's Blue, uh, Lavangula angustifolia, Betty's Blue, Hidcoat, uh, Royal Velvet is really popular and again for good reason. Uh, Melissa is a white flowered uh, variety that's a uh, very good culinary. Um, Tucker's early purple is gaining in popularity. Um, so really any of any of those. And then for the intermedias, probably the most popular lavender variety out there period would be Lavangula intermedia grosso. 
Uh, this was a, a variety that was discovered by a guy with the last name of Grosso back in the 70s and has become the most popular variety. Uh, and again, for good reason, it, it produces the most essential oil out of any variety of lavender. It's got nice long stems with dark purple flowers. Um, so getting into the intermediates, Grosso is a great choice. Uh, Grow Blue, Riverina Thomas is probably my favorite of the intermediates. And that's just a, a great standout, great quality oil, great dried bundles. Um, so as I've said, you almost can't go wrong, you know, if you're sticking with those species um, to, to really kind of get the mix of color and flavor in there. That's terrific. Um, well, I wanted, I wanted to remind folks that there is a tour um, out at Jared's farm this Saturday, if you haven't signed up for that. So just uh, the best way to do it at this point is just to Google OSU Land Stewards and then find our events. It's pretty straightforward on the website. Um, but if you want to see that all in person, that's a good way to do it. And for me, maybe just one final quick question. How did you get interested in lavender? Right. Well, I was into plants long before lavender, and we knew that we wanted to farm. And uh, originally, I was stuck on veggie farming. My uh, sister and brother-in-law owned a restaurant, and I thought I was going to grow the produce for them. But, you know, we, we went to the, the local farmer's market and bought a bottle of lavender spray off of the lavender guy. And then I'm sitting in the garden, like literally rubbing a lavender plant thinking like, what, I mean, do we really want to farm veggies? And at the time it didn't even really occur to me that you can farm lavender. It just seemed like a, a plant in the garden. Right. And so it was kind of around that time that we we thought, well, you can really farm lavender, let's let's do that. And so we kind of put everything into that and, and focused heavily on it. Um, and that was probably, you know, a little over 10 years ago that we decided yeah. that we were gonna grow lavender as our specialty. Neat. So wonderful. That's great. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was just delightful as usual. And we will have the recording out to the folks who've registered uh, and to you also as well, Jared. And um, some of some of us will see you on awesome. Saturday.